Good evening and welcome to this, the third and final uh, of our webinars that we are calling uh, Pathways to Christ's Passion. Uh, my name is Aidan Toomey. Uh, I'm a parishioner in Holy Innocence in Orpington uh, in the Archdiocese of Southwark. Um, we had a very nice uh, note this week from someone following along in Australia. So good morning uh, to anyone in Australia joining over your conflicts. It's uh, lovely to have you with us as well. Uh, the, uh, if you have not uh, been able to catch any of the um, two previous evenings, I would like to direct you to the parish YouTube uh, page where you'll be able to see a recording of both evenings. Uh, I, I won't um, dwell too long on them now, uh, except to summarize for me the uh, what I remember from last week uh, where Father Henry showed uh, two images, uh, one uh, of both of Christ uh, in the Mount of Olives, uh, one uh, showing the agony in the garden, uh, which we see in the synoptics, and the uh, other one showing Christ in command uh, of the garden. And uh, Father Henry has shown us the two sides uh, of Christ, which we, uh, we remember both of them. So uh, tonight, uh, uh, Father Henry is going to deal with uh, St. Paul uh, and how St. Paul uh, portrays uh, the resurrection in, uh, in Acts and his letters. Uh, and uh, so uh, I believe Father Henry is joining us again from uh, uh, Ampleforth, from uh, the uh, Abbey of St. Lawrence, I believe is the patron saint uh, of the, the Abbey. Good evening, Father. Good. How are you? Good evening to you. Thank you very much, Aidan. Not at all. Nice to see you. Start with St. Paul, but then I shall go on to the Gospels in the end. So I think for this talk on the resurrection, I need first of all to explain my method and process. I don't intend to start with the stories of the empty tomb and the meetings with the risen Christ. Rather, I begin with the earliest written evidence for the resurrection, that is the material given in Paul. Paul, of course, was writing his letters in the 50s, so 15 years after the resurrection itself, only 15 years, whereas the Gospels were written, Mark is conventionally dated between 65 and 75, no one really knows, um, and John is even more difficult to date. So, but uh, about there, but at uh, any uh, rate, a good 15 years after Paul. Now, Paul, quotes other people in his letters. He quotes to the Philippians and to the Colossians a poem about the position of the risen Christ. But I think before that, I'd just like to mention the opening of Romans. Romans is the greatest letter, I suppose, the longest letter of Paul. And he, he speaks at the beginning about Christ, who is the Son of God in power at the resurrection. And I, I find that a very strong statement, Son of God in power. In what way was Jesus changed at the resurrection? Well, that's, that's a, a difficult matter altogether, but we'll, we'll proceed gently. So Philippians and Colossians, and then something in First Timothy. Philippians is certainly by Paul. It's his most loving letters. He obviously got on very well with the, with the community of Philippi. They were the only community who gave him money, or rather, to put it differently, they were the only community from whom he would expect accept money. Um, so they, they were very dear. His letter to them is 
very affectionate and warm. So that's why we start. And then Colossians. Colossians is probably by Paul. Raymond Brown once said to me that 70% of the people, of scholars, think that Colossians was by Paul. 30% don't. Raymond Brown was the only person who could make that sort of remark because he'd read everything. It was quite extraordinary. So 30% aren't so sure that, that Colossians is written by Paul. 70% think it was. But we'll, we'll treat it as Pauline anyway. And then there's a snatch of a hymn also in First Timothy. So Philippians, Colossians, and then, then First Timothy. First Timothy was almost certainly not written by Paul, but written by a disciple. And the hymn, which we'll consider, is an earlier piece of writing embedded in the letter to first Tim to Timothy. All these three are therefore evidence not only for the thought of Paul, but the, for the thought of the early Christians before Paul was writing. So they're Pauline, but they're quoting the evidence and the attitude before Paul. They're not in Paul's style. Paul writes in a style called diatribe. It's a, a jerky, impassioned sort of style. Should we this, say this? Heaven forbid. But well, what about that? Well, partly. Should we say this? So he's, he's arguing the thing out and shaving it down until he gets to what he wants to say himself. So that's where Paul is writing, particularly in Romans and Galatians. But Colossians is quite different. It's a much more balanced letter. And the poem in it is rhythmical, calm, and balanced. Now, a letter of Pliny helps us here. Pliny was the governor of the Roman province of Bithynia, the Roman governor. And he writes to a letter to the emperor saying he's got a hold of some Christians. And he's not quite sure what to do about it, what to do about them. Um, and he says, they come together on a fixed day, that is Sunday presumably, and sing a hymn to Christ as to a God. He's speaking on from very much an outsider's point of view, but that's what he says. And I think these three snatches of hymns are just that, hymns to Christ as to a God. And we'll see as we go through it. And Paul picked these up in the Christian assembly and quotes them in his letter. After, after we've looked at those, then, then we will come to look at the meetings with the risen Christ. I say meetings, I don't say visions or appearances of, um, which could be, could give the impression that they're hallucinations or just visions. No, the, 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 Paul uses the word see. They were, they, they saw Christ. Christ was seen. It's an act, actually an ocular vision in Paul and in, in the Gospels too. We'll start with Mark, the earliest and perhaps the least informative, and then we'll go on to John, and finally the reflective accounts in Matthew and Luke. And we'll end with a consideration of the theology. There we are. So the earliest hymns in Paul, Philippians, Colossians, and First Timothy, and then we'll go on to Paul's own experience of the resurrection, or the risen, well, we'll see what it is. And then how all are united in the risen Christ in Paul's theology. That's principally Romans chapter 6. Then go back behind those to the original catechesis learned by heart, then we'll come on to the end of two stories, Mark, John, then Matthew and Luke. And finally, the implications of all this, um, as they are in the, in the New Testament, how it comes together. So we start with the hymn in Philippians. No, I'm not so pleased.
three four line stanzas it's a striking factor that the of all the hymns which we consider that the author isn't, isn't interested so much in the risen body as in the physical nature or, or his physical nature or his relationship with the empty tomb but he's interested in the exaltation of christ paul doesn't so much talk about the empty tomb at all or a risen body he talks about the exaltation of christ here we've got three stanzas each of four lines uh well you may think to begin with that i can't count because the third stanza has got looked as though it has more than four lines but i'll explain that um and paul has added little bits to it now the first thing to note about it is that it's overweight Paul quotes it to sh show that the Chris Christians should be humble, but it's, I think it's too strong for that. And that's one indication that it doesn't, it wasn't originally written for this letter. It was something which Paul took on. And you can look at it in two ways. Some have thought it's balanced um, on Christ is the second Adam. And on the right, you see in heavy type, as Adam, being in the form of God, and Adam was built in the image of God. Well, the difficulty about that is, in the form of God isn't the same as the image of God. It's a different Greek word. But nevertheless, that may be the case. But whereas Adam didn't empty himself, Adam wanted to be like God. So the first Adam was in the form of God, and the first Adam wanted to be like God, but the second Adam emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and becoming, with the first word is being and then becoming, becoming as men are, and being in all respects as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death. Adam, the first Adam, um, wanted to escape death. And you remember the serpent said to Eve, but well, again to Tyndale's translation, Tush, you shall not die. Um, so the serpent says to Eve, you're not going to die if you eat of the fruit. So Adam wanted to escape death. And therefore God raised him high. No, Adam was lowered. Adam was humiliated and cast out of the garden. So it's possible that this hymn is contrasting the second Adam with the first Adam. But I don't think that's the, the, the really important piece of it. He emptied himself, taking the form of the serpent. He did not count equality with God, something to be exploited. That to be exploited, the Greek word is harpagma, something to be snatched and stolen. It's rather like Gollum and the ring, where Gollum hides the ring and grabs it to himself. So Jesus did not count equality with God, something to be grabbed, something to be exploited for his own sake. But he emptied himself, taking the position of a slave. Adam was disobedient, Christ was obedient unto death. As Adam was humbled, so Christ was exalted. The most striking aspect, I think, is shown in the italics, particularly the blue, purple, and red words. Look at the bottom of the page, Isaiah. That is a very important quotation. Isaiah 45, 23. Isaiah 45 was written during the exile in Babylon, and that was the great widening of their knowledge of God, of the Israelite knowledge of God. The Exodus showed them God, I am who I am. And God was their God, was looking after them. That's what's called henotheism. One God, we have only one God. And that was the case before the exile. Um, you remember the story of Nahum and the Syrians. 
who was killed by the prophet and wanted to worship God. Well, in order to worship God back in Syria, he had to have some of the soil of Israel. He had to stand on the soil of Israel so that he was worshipping the God of Israel. That was the idea before the Babylonian exile. The great broadening of the Babylonian exile was that they, they met up with the gods of Babylon, all the gods of Babylon, and had to say, well, how, how do they fit in with us? And they moved from henotheism to monotheism. That is, they realized that God, the one God, is the God of the whole world. And in the second part of Isaiah, chapter 40 to 65, there are many strong passages where the monotheist faith is expressed. All shall bend the knee to me, by every to me, by me every tongue shall swear. In the Lord alone are saving justice and strength. It's a very strong statement of monotheism. Only me to bend the knee. Every tongue shall swear by me. In the Lord alone are saving justice and strength. And look what Paul does. Halfway through the third stanza. So that with the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. Hey, all bend the knee to me, to the Lord God. No, to Jesus every knee should bend. And every tongue shall swear in Isaiah. But in the third stanza, every tongue acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Isn't that blasphemy? No, it isn't. It's to the glory of God the Father. So acknowledging Jesus as Lord in the same sense as God the Father, as in the same sense as God, is to the glory of God the Father. It increases the glory of God. And so to bend the knee to Jesus is again to the glory of God. Now a little bit of explaining the additions. So, to the glory of God the Father, I think, is Paul's addition. Certainly, the fourth line of that third stanza of heavenly, earthy, and subterranean things is a Pauline addition. Um, that's a phrase that he uses fairly frequently, meaning every, detailing everything. And then, in the first, the second stanza, um, death on a cross, that spoils the rhythm, becoming obedient unto death. And Paul adds, death on a cross, because he teaches so much about the cross. So that is the hymn of Philippians. Um, and it's showing that God, that Jesus Christ is Lord in just the same way as the one God of Israel. And that's a very important statement of the risen Christ, the status of the risen Christ. He, you can describe Jesus with the, as Lord, the unpronounceable uh, four-letter word that is too holy to be pronounced. They didn't. They didn't pronounce the word, uh, the Hebrew word for Lord, because it was a very special word. Um, it was an intimate word, a very loving word, like the the name that Mummy gave you when you were a child. Um, and no one wants to don't tell that to anyone. But Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a very warm and particular word. Too warm and too exalted to use in ordinary speech. So that's the hymn in Philippians. Then let's go on to the hymn in Colossians. Here the author turns his attention to the world scale. It's really a revamp of the Book of Wisdom. If you look at the bottom of the side, wisdom is a, the reflection of the eternal light, the mirror of God's active power, the image of his goodness. In the Book of Wisdom, wisdom is that by which God created the world. Wisdom was standing beside God. Wisdom was beside God, anyway. Um, when God created, and it was through his wisdom that he created. And Colossians has the, sorry, uh, 
Proverbs in the book of in the wisdom literature has a poem which I think is important and is used. The Lord created me, the first fruits of his way, before the earliest of his word, works, from everlasting before the earth came into being. I, wisdom, was beside the master craftsman, delighting him day after day, ever at play in his presence, delighting in the children of men. So wisdom is that by which God creates. Now I've set out the panel on the slide, the panel in, in Colossians, in two panels to demonstrate the two worlds or the two creations and the primacy of Christ in each. First, on the left-hand side, the image of the unseen God, who is the image of the unseen God. Now that's in purple. Look at the bottom of the Old Testament. The image of his goodness. The concept of divine wisdom in the book of wisdom and book of proverbs then the firstborn in each panel on the left the firstborn of all creation on the right the firstborn from the dead christ is the firstborn in every way firstborn in creation the firstborn from the dead the two panels are joined together by this little codicil at the bottom in the middle he exists before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. That's pulling them both together. The image of the unseen God, firstborn of all creation, firstborn from the dead. And there are several other parallels between the two panels. For in him all things are created on the left. For in him it, pleased, it pleased God all fullness to dwell and then to reconcile all things. So there are two ways of creation. First is the creation from the beginning, and the second is the firstborn from the dead, so that he should be supreme in every way, the fullness of all creation. All things were created to reconcile all things, through him and for him, through him and for him. So it's the two ways in which Christ is unique and which is held together by he is the head of the body. Each creation is focused on Christ, each in his own way. I've also put at the bottom, I am the light of the world, God from God, light from God. That's the Johannine way of putting it. They're from the prologue in St. John, John chapter 1, verse 9. And that's another way of showing the same thing. I am the light of the world. It expressed, expresses the word in creation in the form of light. Then we come to the third Pauline hymn, which I promised to mention. In First Timothy, the author, of the, the author of this letter is so focused on the tradition that I regard this little song as being traditional also. The letter is, is spattered with saying like, this is a saying you can rely on. This is a true tradition. And this particular saying is introduced by, this is a saying you can rely on. The mystery of our religion is very deep. So it, it's traditional again. And again, it's balanced, but a little differently. The first line coming down from heaven, he was made visible in the flesh. And the last line, taken up in glory. Again, like the hymn at the beginning of the Gospel of John, as it comes down from the Father and then ends up in the Father, in, in the bosom of the Father. So that's a movement which is quite frequent in New Testament hymns, starting in heaven and ending in heaven. He was made visible in the flesh and taken up in glory. And then between those, he's acknowledged in heaven, the blue, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, and on earth as well, proclaimed to the Gentiles, believed in throughout the world. So the first couplet declares that he's acknowledged in heaven by the spirit and the angels. 
and the second that he's acknowledged on earth by the Gentiles and throughout the world. Again, the concentration is on the exaltation of Christ, not on the empty tomb or the risen body. The pre-existence and the incarnation, the reconciliation and the divine situation. No mention of death or resurrection. I'd like to put in there, thus under the Maranatha, that's an Aramaic word, which comes at the end of 1 Corinthians. The early Christians, very earliest generation of Christians, were waiting for the coming of Jesus as Lord. Lord is Mar in Aramaic, as a monastery in the Judean desert called Mar Saba. Maranatha, it can either be there's no division between words in the ancient manuscripts, and it can either be Maran Atta, that is, the Lord is coming, or Marana Ta, depends where you divide it. Marana Ta means, come Lord, come our Lord. And that is given by Paul in this Greek letter to the Corinthians, and obviously, it meant something special. It was a sort of, um, sort of, uh, type talisman word, um, which was so special that you can quote it in Aramaic in a Greek letter. So that they, they were waiting for the Lord to come again as Lord. Then we come on to Paul's own experience on the road to Damascus. Now, we have two descriptions of an event. One narrated three times in, in, by Luke in the Acts of the Apostles, and that's, I think, an exterior account, an exterior description of Paul thrown to the ground by a shaft of light. You can see him on the right. Um, most of us think of the apostle being cast down from his horse. Um, that's the Caravaggio painting. But Paul didn't have a horse. He walked to Damascus. Um, but th we have that description of Paul by, by Luke of what happened. Now, we also have a description by Paul himself, an experience which he describes using apocalyptic language, being taken up into heaven 14 years ago. Is it the same event? I think it is. What about the 14 years? Our knowledge of the chronology of Paul's journeys and of his letters is so uncertain that I'm inclined to view these two at the same event. Luke, in the Acts of the Apostles, is using as his model the story of the Syrian general Heliodorus in the second book of Maccabees. Now, Heliodorus was the general of the Syrian army, and he was about to despoil the temple when he was struck to the ground by an angel and paralyzed. Later he was healed and goes back to the temple and declares the true fate. Paul the same. That's why Luke uses it as a model for the way he tells the story. On the road to Damascus, Paul was on his way to despoiling the Christians, but ends up, when he's healed, by declaring their faith. In his own account, Paul describes the meeting as seeing Jesus, seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces, using the same word as was used for the earlier meetings of the faithful with the risen Christ in the beginning of the first, first letter of the Corinthians, which I quoted right at the beginning of these talks. Is this the same? Is this mystical experience described by Paul in 2 Corinthians, is it the same as the experience described by, by Luke in the Acts of the Apostles? How do you put a mystical experience into words? What did he mean by being snatched up into the third heaven? He doesn't find it necessary to detail whether it was a bodily presence or not. 
But certainly it's a real encounter, not a fleeting glance at a, at a, at a ghost. So seeing the glory of Lord with unveiled faces, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ in the face of Jesus, in the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I think these two events, Luke's description externally and Paul's description in mystical language of being taken up into the third heaven and seeing things which can't be put into words. It's describing his meeting with Christ in a mystical sort of way. Then we come to the stories of the meetings with the risen Christ. And I want to start with the oldest account given by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Again, he's quoting a tradition which he learned by heart. In 1 Corinthians, there are two passages of the tradition. One of the meetings with the risen Christ and the other of the tradition of the Last Supper. In both of these, Paul tells us, he's using the technical rabbinic terminology received and handed on as they're part of the, the tradition. He speaks in a language which is not his own. I said this in the first talk, but I repeat it now. He calls Peter Cephas, which is his Aramaic name, rock. And he twice says, according to the scriptures. Whereas when he's quoting scripture, Paul normally uses the formula as it's written. So the record of the meetings was already traditional some dozen years after the resurrection itself. There were obviously stories. Sorry, I didn't I just Yes, there we are. There, I got, got that in wrong order. You see, I hand it on to you what I have myself received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. Then he was seen by more than 500 of the brothers at one time. And on the right, I show you a tomb, empty, halfway down the page, you can see the stone which closed the entrance. This is ground level. This is in fact the tomb of the Herod family in Jerusalem. And you then go down five steps and go inside to the tomb chamber and leading off the tomb chamber are shafts where you can put a body. This tomb has six shafts, six bodies, um, but that's the empty tomb. He was buried and raised up on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And also I want to give there the picture. This will stand for the garden outside the wall. In fact, you can see there the wall of Jerusalem. It's not the same wall because the same wall has the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is a different wall um, on the east side, whereas the the Holy Sepulchre is on the north side, but it's enough to give us a sort of feel of what it looks like. So that's the empty tomb story. Now go back to Paul, how he evaluates this event. And this is Roman, Romans 6. By baptism into his death, we were buried with him. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the Father's glory, we too should live in newness of life, united to him by dying a death like him, a death like his. So we shall be united by a resurrection like him. Now death there, by, by baptism into his death, death is visualized as a baptism. As in Mark's gospel, when Jesus says, can you be baptized with the baptism with which I must be baptized? So we die in the baptism and rise to a new life. And there on the left is a baptism. And the idea is that you're plunged in three times. And that is symbolic death. And then you rise with a new life. 
also baptism into the name of is when you're baptized into the name of somebody, you're baptized into a new company. And Paul explains this by inventing a whole series of words, all beginning with sun in Greek, which is the word used for synchronized swimming or synchronized watches, put the watches together, or synthetic material, these things put together. And we are con, I think the Latin word is con, we are con buried with Christ. We are con crucified with Christ. There, sun. We are con living with Christ. There in the Greek, con living. Con grown, grown together with Christ. And con raised with Christ. So all those five words are ways, rather barbaric ways, of explaining how we are joined into Christ's resurrection and live with his risen Christ. By baptism, we die to the old, old life, and by the resurrection we are, by rising from the waters, we are united to Christ. Look at the right-hand picture. There is a tree, I photographed this in Australia. It's a eucalyptus tree, tree and the outside is old and has died. And the inside is a fresh growth of tree. It, this is like our life grown again in Christ. It's united, our life is united with Christ and we grow together with Christ. And that is what Paul is trying to explain. So we too should live in the newness of life, united to him by dying a death like his. So we shall be united by the resurre a resurrection like his. We shall be united in the future. But by the time we get to the letter to the Ephesians, it is we are already united to Christ, and it's still the manifestation of this is still in the future. But the unity is already marked. So that is, I think, the most explicit and most promising and most exciting passage of Paul about what happens to us in the resurrection of Christ. Now come on to the gospel stories. And I said I would start with Mark. Um, now, Mark isn't very useful uh, on the resurrection, on what happened at the resurrection. Um, and I want to explain why. The real Gospel of Mark ends at chapter 16, verse 8. And then after that, there is the passage I've got written down at the bottom there. And that is added on afterwards. Um, and it's very secondary. Why should I say that it's added on afterwards? Well, it's lacking. There are three great manuscripts of the fourth century of the whole of the New Testament, the whole of the Bible. One is Sinaiticus from Sinai. That was found at St. Catherine. And there's the monastery of St. Catherine from Sinai. The second is the Vaticanus, which is in the Vatican. And then a third, very important, but not Greek, a third gospel is the Syriac version of the gospel. Gospels translated in, into Syriac. And that also comes from uh, the monastery of St. Catherine. Well, it's not, this passage here is not in any of those manuscripts. And there are a number of words, 12 words in blue, which are not used elsewhere in Mark. So they're not Mark's style. Having risen, go out to those who had seen him. She went and, after this, later, deadly poison. Then it's not Mark's style. And it's rather awkward starting again in verse 9, having risen in the morning on the first day of the week. It doesn't join on neatly. Also, Mary of Magdala is introduced again, from whom he had cast out seven de demons. That, that's awkward. So, and all the facts 
come in the other Gospels and the Acts. So it's generally, not universally, but generally agreed that this passage in Mark is a sort of addition, putting in text from the other Gospels. That after the Gospel meetings um, were known by Matthew and Luke, someone thought there should be meetings with the risen Christ in Mark. Now, if you cut off that and say it's not original, then Mark ends with the women going away. They were afraid, you see. And I think that is a wonderful ending to the gospel. What's going to happen next? They were afraid, and it breaks off there. And it leaves us to imagine what is going to happen. But whether that's correct or not, um, Mark doesn't give us any more uh, from a literary point of view. Now, let's come in Luke and John, two fairly similar scenes in the upper room. These wish to tell us of the empowering of the apostles by the Spirit of Jesus and their mission to bring others to forgiveness topped up with the assurance that this offer is open to all of us who are present at the event. Here we have only the attempt to explain what the risen body is. In some sense it's real and can be touched. So the proof of reality of the risen body, it can be touched and then in Luke Jesus eats a piece of fish. So his body is real. In the same way, in John, Thomas is challenged to touch Jesus, to put his finger into the hand, Jesus' hands and his hand into the wound in his side. So both accounts are stressing that it's a real body. Then both accounts have repentance of all nations. Repentance is vital for joining with, with the risen Christ. Um, Go and preach repentance to all nations, and then whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. And then add that to the new life in Genesis chapter 2. Then Luke has something about afterwards. Jesus, after 40 days, 40, 40 days is an indefinite period, a fairly long period, and um, it's often a period of preparation. So 40 days in the desert for the tempting of Jesus at the beginning of the gospel, 40 years in the wilderness of the Exodus, um, and the ascension 40 days after Jesus rose again. He's taken up to heaven in the same way that Elijah was taken up to heaven in the fiery chariot. And just as Elijah was taken up and Elisha succeeded him, so Jesus is taken up to heaven and the disciples, the apostles, go into Jerusalem and receive the Spirit, enabling them for their, for their mission. That's looking at what's going to happen later. Also here, blessed are those who have not seen, that comes in John, and have believed. And it was also the very important element of joy and praise. In Luke, and then Jesus in, in John says, Peace be with you. Then we, there remain two scenes. Um, John gives us the attractive and homely, challenging, homely and loving scene of the lakeside in Galilee, and that's the two pictures at the bottom. On the left, a lad fishing in the early morning in the Lake of Galilee. Um, and this is just at the place which, which is the traditional place of the meeting between the Apostles and Jesus. And it's just where the where warm springs flow into the lake. And that's um, where the fish gather just after Easter. 
So it uh, likely appears that they would have gone. Um, there on the right is a fishing boat. Um, it's a reconstruction of a fishing boat um, of the first century, which was found just out there, um, deep in the sea itself, and was reconstructed. And that's the sort of fishing boat that they would have been in, um, the disciples would have been in. The odd thing about this is uh, in John 21, the appearance of the lakeside in Galilee, is that they both, both that and the call in Luke, Luke 5, 1 to 11, is the call of the disciple of the first disciples. And both that and the meeting with the risen Christ in John have a miraculous catch of fish. I think that catch of fish is to show that they've got to be fishermen and that it's going to be enormously successful as long as they're with Jesus. Without Jesus, they can do nothing, but with Jesus, the, the apostles can do everything and catch the huge number of fish. I think it's unlikely that this same miraculous, same enormous catch of fish occurred twice. And I think it transferred from one to the other. It's just a way of showing the importance of the fishing that is going to go on and the success of the fishing. Then finally, we come to the finales of, of Matthew and Luke. The finale of Matthew on the Holy Mountain in Galilee, that has all the marks of a Matthean composition. Jesus is the second Moses on the Holy Mountain, as he was at Sinai on the Sermon on the Mount. The third temptation, he went up onto the mountain. The transfiguration, he went up onto the mountain. So Jesus goes up onto the mountain as the second Moses. And it's also the place where he goes to pray. Furthermore, the first thing, the Son of Man in glory. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. That is Jesus' preferred title. He won't accept any other title until the appearance before the high priest. But the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man can do this and very thing. All now all power on earth is given. Jesus is quoting the Son of Man in Daniel, who comes to the one of great age and is given all power. In Daniel, the Son of Man is given all power on earth. In Matthew, he's given all power in heaven and on earth. So the Son of Man in Daniel is great. The Son of Man in Matthew is greater still, all power in heaven and on earth. Also in Matthew is the presence of Christ in the church. I am with you all days, even to the end of time. That comes throughout the Gospel of Matthew. At the beginning, Jesus is, is named Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then he says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And now at the final party, he says, I am with you even, even to the end of time. So this is the party of Jesus from his disciples. It's the Matthean equivalent of Luke's ascension. I think there is the Mount Sinai. Um, taken from Mount St. Catherine, um, and there is the little chapel on top of Mount Sinai, where the, which is the actual place, they say, um, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Well, I don't know if we actually know the actual place, but that's the chapel anyway. And what Matthew is saying is that the appearance, the meeting on the mountaintop at the end of the, of the gospel is the completion of the Sinai covenant, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. 
It's again, it's obeying the law. Then Luke's finale. Luke seen on the way to Emmaus. It was typical of his genius for teaching theology by means of the story. Um, photograph on the right is the road to Emmaus. Emmaus is down there in the bottom of the valley. And this is the road, well, the track from Jerusalem. I'm afraid that a petrol station, a filling station has now been built on there. And so you can't see it any longer. When I took the photograph, you can still see the track going down to Emmaus. It's beautifully told. It's the myth of the Christian apostolate. And one scholar says, Emmaus never happened. Emmaus always happens. I don't think you have any right to say Emmaus never happened. But Luke presents it as Emmaus always happens. This is the story of the Christian apostolate. It's beautifully done. You start in Jerusalem and you end in Jerusalem. They're talking together and then on the way back they said to each other, on the way down, Jesus came up, Jesus vanished. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Their eyes were open. Their hopes were dashed, they said, and now the hope was fulfilled. They went to and alive, the center is that Christ is alive, and they find him alive. So it's beautifully narrated in a balancing way. And the important thing is that this is the Christian apostolate. I say it's the myth of the Christian apostolate. No, well, it's a story, the story of the Christian apostolate. And the story is told in such a way that you see that it is the Christian apostolate. They listen to the scripture. They are well-intentioned to begin with, open-minded and questioning, talking together. Then Jesus comes up and explains to them the scripture as we learn about Christ and we learn about the Lord from the scripture. And then they go to Emmaus itself and there they recognize Jesus in the sacrament. And then they go back to Jerusalem and carry on at their own apostles. So that's why some people call it the myth of the, of the Christian apostolate. I wouldn't say it's the, a myth, it's the story of the Christian apostolate. And Luke tells the story in a way which brings this out. So all these accounts have entered into the Christian consciousness and they're full of many attractive details. So for me, the inspired expositions of the effects and development of the resurrection of Christ and its meaning for the church. And we need to meditate on them and learn from them as we seek to enter more deeply into the Christian mystery. So we must meditate on them and learn uh, from them. What a lovely way to finish up uh, uh, Father, um, uh, had any suggestions for people who might want to read a little further on the things we've um, uh, things we've discussed the last three weeks? Well, there, there are four excellent books by Donald Senior um, called "The Passion According to Each of the Evangelists," and I think I, I don't know anything better than those four books on the Passion and the Resurrection. So, Donald Senior. Donald Senior, I have not come across those, so I will teach it in Chicago. Very good. So with that, uh, I have a few uh, thank yous uh, to make uh, for uh, the people who have uh, helped uh, um, so much over uh, the last, uh, putting these uh, webinars on over the last three weeks. So uh, if you, uh, I'd like to thank very much people in our parish, uh, Maria, Nedicott and Bob and Cecilia Scudder for all their help. Uh, I know it's very bad form to uh, thank people in particular, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to particularly thank uh, Suzanne uh, Kelly uh, because A, she's very helpful, but she's also very busy. Uh, and I know this because she is preparing my daughter for her Sunday communion. So thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I would like to thank our parish priests, uh, Father Victor, uh, who has a special gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, the gift of delegation. Uh, so uh, he, uh, without Father Victor, this wouldn't have happened. 
uh, but all through the power of delegation. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank very much uh, the assistance we've received from uh, uh, the diocese, from uh, Mark Nash uh, at the Agency for Evangelization and Catechesis, and to Joe Driver as well. Uh, and uh, but uh, most of all, the last, uh, I would like to very, very uh, Sincerely, thank you, Father Henry. We have a, 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 a message here from Judy Peel, uh, uh, which I think, I think comes from everyone in Orpington. Uh, there's not so much a question, but a big thank you for all three webinars. They have been excellent and thought provoking. Uh, so that's uh, from Nick Peel, who's, who's uh, uh, sent that. Uh, but I'd like to say, if I may interrupt, I would like to thank all the people who you thank, and thank you as well for being such an excellent question master. It's been an absolute, an absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks all around. And maybe Father uh, Henry, if you could uh, close the webinars with uh, a prayer uh, uh, to send us on uh, thoughtfully on our way. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. And may the Lord be as close to the end especially in this coming season of the Passion and the Resurrection, enable us to understand more how closely we are united to Christ and how our life should be buried in Christ and rising with him to live with his life. Amen. Amen.